opportunity to present closing argument pursuant to the rules of procedure. The state goes first. State, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, the testimony and the evidence that has been introduced during these proceedings has shown and revealed what happened, what occurred on Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 2018. Exactly what happened. The testimony revealed the unspeakable, horrific brutality and the unrelentless cruelty that the defendant performed in the 1200 building on February the 14th, 2018. It has been said that what one writes and that one says is a window into someone's soul. And some of the remarks the defendant wrote on his YouTube were, no mercy, no questions, double tap. I'm going to kill a shit ton of people and murder children. And on July the 4th, 2017, I love to see the families suffer. You're entitled, and I suggest that every YouTube comment, every search, everything that's in evidence, you can review when you're deliberating. And I suggest you take all the evidence, all the videos, all the photographs, all the records back to consider. And look at the comments, the YouTube comments and the searches the defendant wrote and what he searched. Because what one writes, what one says, is a window to someone's soul. What he wanted to do, what his plan was, and what he did, was to murder children at school and their caretakers. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he planned to do, that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. And he picked Valentine's Day to do it while school was in session. And you can tell by the evidence and the testimony you've been sitting here and listening to everything, this plan was goal-directed, it was calculated, it was purposeful, and it was a systematic massacre. And this is just not somebody with a high-powered AR-15 rifle shooting people. And I'm going to get into the details, but just to start off with Gina Montaldo and Luke Hoyer and Martin Duque Aquiano. I'm going to go over it, but if you can remember from the start, they were huddling in front of classroom 1214, hiding and wounded. What the defendant did, the first thing you do is you think about it, and we know from looking at his YouTube comments and his searches, he was certainly thinking about it. In fact, he told, uh, I think it was Dr. Denny that, or Dr. Scott, that he'd been watching the Columbine when he was 13 or 14 years old, the Columbine shooting. So we know he's been talking about it for a long time and thinking about it for a long time. So what's he do? First thing you do, you want to accomplish something, you research. So he researched. He researched prior mass shootings. So he researched, obviously, Columbine, because he mentioned that when he was 13 or 14. So he looks up the Columbine mass shooting at the school, uh, Charlottesville shooting, the uh, McDonald's mass shooting in, in San Diego, the Montreal uh, Polytech in Montreal, Canada, the Las Vegas shooting that I mentioned before, the Aurora shooting that I mentioned before, the Aurora, Colorado, Colorado movie theater, Virginia Tech. He researches the Virginia Tech mass shooting. He looks up uh, Westlake, Minnesota high school shooting and also the Jacola High School in Finland. 
He did all that research. And then what else do you do after you do your research? You get all your details in order. Was he detailed? Let's look at what he does. First of all, he buys, he already had, his AR-15, Smith & Wesson 5.56 M&P 15, serial number TF-16214. When did he buy that? He bought that on February, he picked it up. On February the 18th, 2017, almost a year before the murders at Marjory Stoneman Douglas. So he had the gun. So what else do you need now? Now, we know from him speaking to Dr. Denny and Dr. Scott, he made some additions to this gun. He put a, a bipod on it. And you see, you'll see it. It's, you've seen it. It's in evidence. He put a vertical grip for better balance. And he put a sling on it. So now what do you need for a mass shooting? You need a lot of what? You need a lot of ammunition. You need a lot of rounds. You need a lot of bullets. So it accumulates a lot of bullets. What did he say on the cell phone video? A couple what? Tracer rounds. So we got tracer rounds. What, what else do you need? If you have bullets and you have a semi-automatic weapon, you have to have a, a firearm magazine. It goes in a, a firearm magazine well. So he accumulates magazines, and we know from the testimony that he brought 11 firearm magazines to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas when he entered the, the, the 1200 building. Okay, so now you have that. What else do you need? Well, how long does it take a cop to respond to a school shooting? He researched that, and you can see that, you know, in what's been introduced in his searches. How long does it take uh, for a cop to respond to a school shooting? What else? The bell schedule. Even though he went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he downloaded the bell schedule. What else do you need? You need, oh, now you have magazines and you put your bullets in the magazines. How are you going to get these magazines to the school? Well, how about a vest? And the vest has to have a lot of pockets because you're going to put those magazines. And the magazines that are or left, or in evidence. Feel how heavy just one of them is. Now he's got to get something to keep these magazines, to take them to the school. So he gets this vest that has 10 pockets, pouches, so he can put those magazines, those full, fully loaded magazines in that vest. Okay, now he's got a vest. You can't wear that vest and just get in the Uber and go to school with, with that vest. So you have to do what? You have to find a way to transport that vest. So he has a backpack, and what does he do? He puts the vest in the backpack, in the vest are the 10 magazines. 40-round uh, magazine. I think there were two 40-round magazines, and the rest were 30-round magazines, and he had a 10-round magazine in his pocket. What else? You gotta take the gun. You just can't take the gun on Uber. So you may recall that he was searching uh, for a guitar case. He finally wound up with that Cabela bag. All right, so now you got this, this Cabela bag, you have to figure out what? Something to say to the Uber driver, because she may be suspicious. So what does he say to her? I'm going to music class. Explains his instrument that he's taking. So now he has the, the, uh, something to transport his rifle, something to, to transport the vest that contains the magazines. What else? You want to blend in, right? So he gets his JROTC polo shirt to wear. All these details he thought of and he did. That's exactly what he did. And when he went there, he told the Uber driver he was going to music class. He told the Uber driver, and. This is really interesting. You talk about executive function. Remember the, the, the mental health experts were talking about executive function? He's on his way to school, uh, to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. He's directing uh, Laura Zucchini. She was the Uber driver. Uh, where to go? Remember, she was going to go uh, straight down and um, Hamburg Road and cross Pine Island and go to a different exit? No, no. He didn't want to go there. He knew... First of all, in planning, you have to know where you're going to go. So he wanted to go to the pedestrian gate that's on Pine Island Road. So he directed 
Miss Lucchini to make a left-hand turn on the Pine Island to go to the pedestrian gate. You also have to research what time you're going to get there. First of all, those gates lock after the students and the teachers go into school, so they have to open up prior to school letting out. But you don't want to get there exactly when school's letting out at 2.40 because you're going to be what? Losing your targets. So he gets there after the gates open and before school lets out at 2.40 because he arrives what? At 2.19. He starts shooting in the hall at 2.21.33. So he did all this research, he did all this thinking, and on the way to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the Uber, what is he doing? Remember they're talking about executive function? What is he doing? And it's introducing evidence, look at it. He is having a two, well actually it's a three-way because he's involved, with two other people. He's trying to get and talk, text, not talk, but text, to uh, Angie, Angie uh, Gilmartin, who's not at Marjorie Stoneman, she's at another school, and she says, look, I'm busy, I'm at school, I'll talk to you later. And then he's also texting uh, J.T. Jameson, uh, Jameson uh, Snee, who he was living with that family, about having a party and having girls over. So he's having this conversation on his way, his texting conversation, to do two different people while he's on his way. And he tells J.T. Snee, what? Can you get the girls there? Uh, where are you going? I'm going to the movies. I'm not going to work. I don't uh, go to school on Valentine's Day. And I'm going to call my employer and tell them I'm not coming, but I'm going to the movies. All the way, on the way uh, to accomplish his plan. So he arrives at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School at 2.19 p.m. He gets out of the back seat of Miss Zucchini's uh, the Uber, uh, I think it was a RAV4, and he directly goes to the 1200 building east exit. Uh, you've been there, so you know that's the, the closest, the cl that, we're, uh, that pedestrian gate is the closest exit or entrance to the 1200 building. So he goes into the east uh, double doors and immediately makes a right into the east stairwell. And as he takes out uh, his AR-15 style rifle, that Smith & Wesson 5.5 Smith M&P 15, takes it out of uh, the Gabella rifle bag, uh, in walks Christopher uh, McKenna. Christopher McKenna was a student who was in 1216, in classroom 1216. He was out on the pass, and he walks into the stairwell, and face to face, to Nicholas Cruz, and Cruz says to him, you better get out of here, something bad is about to happen. So Christopher McKenna runs, and he goes to get one of the school monitors, Aaron Feist. So he steps, Cruz steps out of the uh, east stairwell, and in, in the, and in the east stairwell now, there are four students. Ashley Baez is walking west in the hallway, Gina Montaldo uh, was sitting on the floor. She got permission from her teacher, uh, Miss Matlock, uh, to, to work on it. It was more quiet in the hallway, to sit in the hallway right in front of classroom 1215 and work on her computer. And standing beside her, knocking on the door to 1215 to get back into classroom 1215 because they had, had uh, passes to go somewhere else, uh, was Luke Hoyer and Martin Duque Aquiano, they were students in 1215, and they were knocking on the door uh, to get back in. Cruz steps out of the stairwell, fires and hits in the leg, Ashley Baez. And maybe you can remember from uh, the video that she uh, runs across the hall and runs into classroom 1210. He fires at Gina, uh, Luke, and Martin. Then he goes over to classroom 1216. 1216, classroom 1216, if you recall, is the second classroom on the north part of the, on the north side of the hall. It's the second classroom as you come in the east double doors. So he fires into classroom 1216, it shatters the glass, and he fires and he hits. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, uh, 
Alex Schack, uh, Schachter, who was getting up from his desk. He hits him twice in the chest. Alex was 14 years old, got shot twice in, twice in the chest, and he died of, of his wounds. Cruz fires into 1216, then he walks away right next to 1216. He kneels on the ground, he takes off his backpack, he unzips it and brings out his tactical vest with the 10 magazines in it. He puts the vest on, he takes out the 10 round magazine, lays it on the ground, pulls out a magazine from the vest and puts a new magazine uh, in, into the gun. Then he walks over to classroom 1214 and 1215. 1215 is the second classroom on the south side of the hall from the east uh, double door entrance. And on the south side, 1214 and 1215 here, uh, the, first, the first classroom coming in is 1218. Then there's 1215 and then there's 1214. And 1214 and 1215 abut the right next to each other. And that's where Gina and Luke and Martin are. So he fire, he walks up there and fires into them, wounding them. He then fires into classroom 1214, which was the Holocaust class. He hits Helena Ramsey. Helena Ramsey was 17 years old. He shoots her four times, killing her. He shoots and kills Nicholas Dorette, who was 17. He shots, shoots, and kills him, shoots him three times. He wounds Samantha Brady, Samantha Fuentes, uh, Isabel Checker, and Danielle Menescu. Then he walks back to 1216 and fires additional shots into 1216. This time he kills, shoots, and kills Elena Petty. Elena Petty was shot four times and she died of her wounds. He shoots and kills Alessa Alphadev. She shot eight times and she died of her wounds. He also wounded William Olson, Justin Colt, Genesis Valentin, uh, Alexander Durrett, who's the brother of Nicholas Durrett, who was just shot and killed over in 1214, and Keshava Magaporin. So there was five people he wounded in 1216. Then he moves west. And as he's moving west, in comes the athletic director, uh, school monitor, Christopher Hickson. He runs through the west doors. And when he runs through the west doors, the defendant, Nicholas Cruz, shoots him twice. Once in the uh, torso and once in the leg. Christopher Hickson falls to the ground and crawls over to the north side of the hall to an alcove. Uh, near the west door and double door entrance. And he's seeking, you know, cover, shelter. The defendant continues west. And when he comes up to 1215 again, he shoots into Gina again, Martin again, and Luke again. And Gina, and you saw the photographs, you remember the, the testimony of Dr. Osborne? the medical examiner, he did the autopsy on Gina Montalvo. She was shot four times, and she died of her wounds. But two of those wounds, two of those wounds were contact wounds. Contact wounds, which means the end of that M&P 5.56 AR-15 style rifle was right up against her chest and right up on her abdomen. Right on her skin. She was shot four times and she died. And she also had what uh, Dr. Osborne called a defensive wound. What's a defensive wound? When someone tries to protect themselves by raising their legs or their hands. Joaquin Oliver had one too, if you recall. Gina had a bullet that went through the back of her hand and came out her palm as if holding up to protect herself. She had a contact wound of her chest and her abdomen. She died of her wounds. And you remember what one of the YouTube comments from Nicholas Cruz was? Remember? I don't mind 
shooting a girl in the chest. That's exactly what he did to Gina Montalvo. Then he walks, after he shoots into uh, Luke and uh, Martin and, and Gina, he proceeds to uh, 1213. 12, thir classroom 1213 is the next classroom as you proceed west on the north side of the hall next to 1216. He fires into 1213, and when he fires into 1213, he shoots and kills Carmen Chentra. He hits one of the shots, hit her in the head, and she died of her wounds. He wounds Madeline Wilford, Samantha Mayer, and Benjamin Wickander. Then he proceeds west, and as he's proceeding west, he passes on the north side of the hall Christopher Hickson. And I'm going to show the video. He turns and fires a third shot into Christopher Hickson, uh, and Christopher Hickson died of his wounds. Christopher Hickson was 49 years old. The defendant then walks in, walks to the interior door that leads into the west stairwell, and as he enters the west stairwell, here's Aaron Feist. Aaron Feist is the is a coach, and he was. Um, a school monitor that Christopher McKenna ran to get. And uh, Coach Feist opens up the outside door uh, to the west stairwell. Just as Cruz enters the stairwell from the interior door, Cruz turns and fires and hits Christopher, uh, uh, Coach Feist, twice in the chest, killing him. Coach Feist was 37 years old. He died of his rooms right there outside that west stairwell door. Cruz then goes up to the second floor and uh, goes up the, on the west stairwell to the second floor looking for more targets. Now, the students and teachers on the second floor had heard the shots from the first floor. The defendant fired 70, I'm going to say that again, the defendant fired 70 shots on the first floor, and two shots in the west stairwell at Coach Vice. You talk about finger tapping, and you, and you heard, heard it. He fired 70 shots on the first floor. So he goes up to the second floor. The teachers and, uh, the teachers and students had heard uh, the sound, so now they're taking precautions, a code red, for an active shooter. So they turn off the lights, they get away from the door, they're, they're hiding. And there, as you know, there's 10 classrooms on the first floor, 10 on the third floor, and second floor, 10 on the third floor. So the 10 classrooms on the second floor, three of those classrooms were empty. Uh, the defendant fired six shots on the second floor. He couldn't find any targets. He fired into classroom 1231, which was empty, and 1234, which was empty. So he goes the length of the hallway after firing the six shots, and now he's at the east stairwell. So he goes up the east stairwell. Now, the students and teachers on the third floor didn't hear, they heard some noises, but they weren't as distinct as what the teachers and students heard on the second floor. So they, uh, at, at 2, 2.22.38, 2.22.38, the fire alarm went off. And remember we talked about the evidence was that the dust from the ceiling tiles because of the percussion of the defendant firing his weapon on the first floor 70 times caused the ceiling tiles to pop up. And when the ceiling tiles popped up, dust came down. And you saw it on the video, the dust it looks like smoke. So the camera system doesn't know the difference between dust and smoke. So it sounded at 2.20, uh, 2.38. So the, the teachers and, and the students on the third floor, when they hear the fire alarm at 2.20, 2.38, uh, they evacuate. They didn't hear the shots like the students and teachers on the second floor. So they, and, and as you know, there's a stairwell on the east side and there's a stairwell on the west side, so the students and teachers started to evacuate. But once they started, the students started to evacuate, they heard the shots on the second floor, so, and you saw it on the video, they all come running back, and there's a mishmash, everybody running and trying to get, get somewhere. Meanwhile, the defendant is coming up the east stairwell. 
And as he comes up the east stairwell and opens the door, the first classroom on the east side, on the north, uh, north part of the hallway, is 1256. And that's Scott Deagle's classroom. He's a ge he was a geography teacher. So he is holding the door open. And you can see it on the video. He's holding the door open for his students so they can get into the classroom. And the teacher next to him in 1255 was Stacy LaPel. She was the English teacher right next to him. She's also ho holding the door open for students, not just their students, any students, to run into the classroom for safety. So when Cruz comes in out of the stairwell, he fires four shots into the back of 35-year-old Scott Beagle and kills him. Scott Beagle died right there. He also fired and wounded Stacy LaPelle. The defendant continues to fire down the hallway. He hits and wounds Meadow Pollock and Carol Logren, and they run and they hide in the alcove of classroom 1249. He shoots and wounds uh, Anthony Borges, Kyle Lehman, and Marion Kabachenko, who were in the hallway. He continues to move west, and as he's moving west, he fires again. This time, the students are, are running to the west stairwell. He hits in the leg Joaquim Oliver, who runs into the alcove of the men's restroom on the north side of the hallway. He shoots and he hits Peter Wang, who falls on the southwest corner right next to the west stairwell door. And he hits and kills Jamie Guttenberg. Jamie Guttenberg is running to the west stairwell. And as she runs, he shoots her and hits her in the back. In the back, right near her neck, it severs her spinal cord. I don't know if you remember Dr. Osborne's testimony. She falls through the west stairwell door and falls onto the uh, third floor landing on the west stairwell. The defendant continues west, and you'll see it on the video. He turns and aims into Meadow Pollock and Carol Logren. Carol Logren was shot three times. She's 14 years old, and she died of her wounds. Meadow Pollock was shot six times, and she was in the alcove with Kara. Uh, she was 18 years old. She died of her wounds. Then the defendant goes over to the uh, men's west room alcove where Joaquim Oliver is, and he fires into Joaquim Oliver. Joaquim Oliver was shot four times, 17 years old. He died of his wounds. Remember the, the testimony of Dr. Topps, the medical examiner? He said there was a defensive wound, that the bullet went through the palm of the right, of the palm of his right hand, exited the back of his right hand, and entered into uh, Joaquim Oliver's left temple killed him. The defendant then leaves from the west, uh, the restroom on the west side and proceeds down to uh, Peter Wang. And you saw in the video that uh, Peter Wang was laying on the ground. Remember when the kids were running out, students were running out, you can see him moving. So when he's laying on the ground, what? He's still alive, right? Because he's moving. Cruz walks up to Peter Wang and shoots him in the head four times. Peter Wang was shot 12 times. And you remember what the defendant told, uh, I think it was Dr. Denny, could have been Dr. Scott, that when he shot Peter Wang, his head blew up like a watermelon. Remember that? He was shot four times in the head. Peter Wang died of his wounds. The defendant then goes over and he looks out the west stairwell door, that little window in the door. And then he doesn't go down the stairwell. He goes into 1240. He shoots the glass out, shatters the glass, reaches in, opens the door, and now he's in 1240, the teacher's lounge. Why is he in 1240? Because of what I was talking about before. He, the west windows look over the, uh, the west part of the campus, and the south windows Look over the south part of the campus. On the south side, there's a courtyard. On the west, there's walkways and there's parking lots. The defendant 
fired his AR-15 five times out of the west window and five times out of the south window looking for targets. He left a 40-round empty magazine on the desk in 1240, and he left uh, 1240 after firing those 10 rounds. So up on the third floor, he fired 51 rounds in the third floor and another 10 rounds in uh, 1240. So that's 61 rounds he fired on the third floor. The 10 in 1240 and the 51, you know, outside of 1240. So you got a total of 139 rounds that the defendant fired in the 1200 building on uh, February the 14th, 2018. So he goes out uh, of, of 1240, he passes the body of Peter Wang, opens up the door, it's on the third floor landing, laying there uh, dead is uh, Jamie Guttenberg. He takes off his vest, lays it on the third floor landing, take, puts his rifle down next to it, and he runs down the stairs and exits the west doors uh, to the 1200 building. He runs south and then west. Uh, he runs west and then south uh, by the tennis courts. And as he's running south, what does he do? He blends in with all the students and the teachers who are evacuated. Oh, he's got his JROTC polo shirt on, blended right in. As a matter of fact, he bumps into Nicolette Muccietta. Remember her testimony? She sees him. And she hadn't seen him in a while, but she knew him from school, and she says to him, hi. He responds, hi. Uh, plans for she says to him, plans for college? The defendant responds, somewhere in Florida. Then he walks to the Walmart, to the subway that's inside of, of Walmart, gets an icy. You saw the video. Calmly gets an icy. In fact, he left the tip. Then he leaves there, leaves Walmart, goes on Carl Ridge Drive, and he goes to McDonald's. And I think you remember the testimony, uh, I think it was Officer Leonard. Uh, the McDonald's uh, is about one point, uh, from where he was arrested, McDonald's is 1.8 miles from where he was arrested. He was arrested on Wyndham Lakes Boulevard. <coughs> so he goes down to McDonald's, and sitting in McDonald's at a table is John Wilford. Just so happens, John Wilford is the brother of Madeline Wilford, who was shot and wounded in classroom 1213. But the defendant didn't know John Wilford, and John Wilford didn't know the defendant, but the defendant walks up to him as he's sitting in the booth, and he starts talking, and he asks John Wilford for a ride, and John Wilford says, I can't give you a ride. My mom's picking me up. And sure enough, the mother came, they both get up, John Wilford walks out, the defendant follows him, John Wilford gets in his mom's car, the defendant crosses uh, Carl Ridge Drive into Wyndham Lakes and walks around. So he, uh, Officer Leonard spots him and arrests him at approximately 12.40 p.m. So the place of arrest was 1.8 miles from McDonald's and 2.9 miles from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and he's placed under arrest. So when crime scene from the Broward Sheriff's Office comes, uh, yeah, they obviously find, remember they found the video with the three video, the cell phone videos on it in the east stairwell. They find the Cabela bag in the east stairwell. Well, they also find, uh, obviously, the rifle, the 5.56 Smith & Wesson m and 15. Had a round in the chamber, as you probably know, with a semi-automatic, you know, once something's a, a, a round goes out the barrel, another one pops in. So there was a round in the uh, chamber, and there were 23 rounds still in the magazine. And the magazine, it was that, that was the magazine with a swastika on either side of it. Well, in that magazine, there were 23 rounds. Of the 23 rounds, guess what? 11 of them were tracer rounds. So, and in the best, there were five uh, magazines. There was a 40-round magazine, you know, in the, the tactical vest in one of the pouches. There was a 40-round magazine that was fully loaded with 40 rounds. 
There were three 30 round magazines that were fully loaded with 30 rounds. And there was a 20, uh, another 30 round magazine that had 29 rounds in it. And in one of those magazines, there was another nine tracer rounds. Now, uh, remember uh, George Bellow? He was the firearms expert. He says, I can tell a tracer round when it's full because of the orange tip and how, it, how it's manufactured. But once it's fired, I can't tell if any of the casings that were found of the 139 casings, if any of them were tracer rounds. But there were 11 tracer rounds in the magazine that was in the gun and another nine tracer rounds there were in one of the magazines that was found in the vest. The police also found three magazines on the first floor, an empty 10 round magazine, an empty 30 round magazine, and another magazine in the hallway that was a 30 round magazine that had nine rounds in it that hadn't been fired. On the third floor, there was an empty 30 round magazine in the third floor hallway. And you can see in the video him reloading on the third floor. And there was a 40 round empty magazine in uh, the teacher's lounge at, at, uh, at 1240. So that was an empty 40 round. So there are five empty, mat well, five magazines, four of them were empty, one had nine rounds in it. Uh, and of course there was 23 rounds in, well, actually 24, it was one in the chamber in, in, in the rifle that he left behind. So he carried out his plan. And his plan was, and he told everybody what his plan was. They found the, the, his phone and the cell phone uh, with three cell phone videos on it. And the one that he made on February the 11th, 2018, Hello, my name is Nick. I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is to kill at least 20 people with an AR and a couple of trace rounds. I think I can get it done. Location, Stoneman Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll know who I am. Ha ha, you're all going to die. Can't wait. Can't wait. That was his plan. He carried it out. So you're going to see that in these proceedings, and we talked about it, aggravating and mitigating circumstances. The state is limited uh, about of the aggravating factors that uh, can, can be... Um, they can rely on by Florida statutes. And in this case, uh, we're limited to seven aggravating factors. And before I discuss the aggravating factors, Aaron, I'd like to play the video, please. <coughs> this is not to be published to the public, yeah. correct? N not to the public. Not, not to be published to the public. Right. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I just want you to see how tactical and how purposeful his actions are.
Aaron, would you show uh, the chest wound of uh, Gina Montalvo, please? And this is not for the public viewing either? No, Your Honor. Okay. So aggravating factors, uh, Florida statutes uh, say what aggravating factors the state can use. We limited this case to seven aggravating factors. So I'd like to go over them with you. First, I'll give you a list and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. The first one, the defendant has been previously convicted of another capital felony or a felony involving the use or threat of violence to another person. Uh, so in this case, um, simultaneous uh, convictions. So the defendant has pled guilty to 17 uh, first-degree murders, a capital felony. So for each, uh, each victim, the other 16 can be aggravating factors for that, that victim. And the 17 attempted first-degree murders of the 17 surviving victims they're contemporaneous, but they can also be considered as previous convictions. So for each victim, there's 17 attempted uh, first degree murders that are, could be to aggravate the offense, right? And then if you'll recall, on November the 13th, 2018, 10 months after the defendant was arrested for the, uh, for the, the murders, uh, he attacked Sergeant Deputy Beltran in the jail. Remember that? Uh, tried to take his taser. You saw, the, you saw the video. And if you want to see the video again, you can. You take it back uh, to the jury room. <clears throat> How he ran up and attacked him, took his taser away, took his weapon away. So there's, there's three convictions you can consider for that. Attempted aggravated battery of a law enforcement officer as one. Battery on a law enforcement officer is two. And uh, taking uh, means of protection from a law enforcement officer is three. So for each, each victim, you have the 16 uh, other capital murders, the 17 uh, attempted first degree murders, and the three offenses uh, that I just mentioned involving the attack on Sergeant Beltran on November 13, 2018, okay? So that's the first aggravated, previously convicted of a prior capital felony or a felony uh, 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 by the use or threatened uh, the use of force to another person. The second one is the defendant knowingly created a great risk of death to many persons. That speaks for itself. The third one is that uh, the first degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. The fourth one is the first degree murder was cold, calculated, and premeditated. The next one is that the capital, the first degree murder was committed to disrupt or hinder a lawful governmental function to which the functioning of the school, that a victim of the first degree murder was an appointed public official. And in this case, you have Scott Beagle, who was a geography teacher for the school board, who was shot in uh, front of his classroom, 1256. Uh, Christopher Hickson, who was the athletic director and a coach, and also a campus monitor. And Aaron Feist, who was a uh, coach and also a campus monitor. So the, that, the killing of a public official during the course of their uh, public uh, duties uh, is applicable to those three. Scott Beagle, Aaron Feist, and Christopher Hickson. And they were shot down during the course of their official duties. The other one is that um, during the course of a burglary, you say, what are you talking about? Well, when you enter somewhere where you have no permission, 
campus to commit an offense to it murder. That's a burglary. So there are seven aggravating factors for that you can consider. And remember, we've talked about this, that it is not a counting process, it's a weighing process. And each one of the aggravators and each one of any mitigators, uh, you're going to have to weight. Some are going to have no weight, some are going to have some weight, some are going to have middle weight, some are going to have a lot of weight, and some are going to have great weight. So it's a, it's a weighing process, it's not a counting process. So first I'd like to talk about the first aggravating factor, the defendant was previously convicted of a capital felony or another felony involving the threat or use of violence. As I said, uh, let's just take Gina Montaldo or, or any one of the, 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 the people who, who were murdered. The other murders of the other 16 can be used as aggravation of their murder. So uh, Scott Beagle, 16. Uh, Meadow Pollock, 16. And you go down the line. So there's 16. And the 17 attempted first three murders of the victims that were, who survived, like William Colton and Madeline Wilford, uh, all those can be used, 17. And then the three felonies uh, with uh, Beltran. So they're like 36 felonies. So even though it's one aggravator previously convicted, you have to weigh each one of these aggravators. And some aggravators you're going to find way more than other aggravators. And this aggravator has 36. This is one headed aggravating factor. 17 people were killed, 17 people were attempted to be killed, and the three felonies on Sergeant Beltran when the defendant was in jail. That is one heavy aggravating factor. The next one, that uh, the defendant knowingly created a great risk of death to many persons during the homicide. Well, he murdered 17 he wounded another 17, and he was trying for more. So there's no question that that aggravating factor has been proven beyond any reasonable doubt, just like the first aggravating factor was proven beyond any reasonable doubt. And the third aggravator, the first-degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Cruel! It's like I said, it's unrelentlessly cruel, heinous and atrocious. The people, that, and you saw the video again, and I discussed it, the people were out in the opening. He went and finished them off. You saw him pointing, uh, not casually either, aiming and killing the people out in the open. Uh, he was shooting the kids in the classroom that were hiding or attempting to hide. Uh, so you have uh, Gina and Luke and Martin who were in front of 1215. You have Kara and, and Meadow hiding uh, in the alcove in, in 1249. Uh, uh, Joaquin uh, Oliver uh, in the men's restroom uh, alcove. Uh, Peter Wang uh, laying on, on the ground. And you have in, in 1216, uh, Alex you know, trying to get up to, to hide. He got shot twice in the chest. Um, Elena Petty and Alyssa Alphadeth uh, were hiding when they were shot down and killed. In 1214, uh, you have Helen Ramsey and Nicholas Durrett who were hiding when they were killed. They all knew what was going on, what was going to happen, what was happening here, the nature, the danger, the deadly nature of the situation. And uh, Carmen Chentruck, uh, who was shot in, in 1213, and the kids that are all running uh, on the third floor, uh, Jamie Guttenberg running uh, to the west stairwell to escape, uh, Peter Wang running, Joaquin Oliver running, and, and Kara and Meadow hiding. Uh, heinous, atrocious, or cruel beyond any reasonable doubt. The other one was it cold, calculated, and premeditated? Well, 
We talked about that. This guy researched it. He even researched a uh, high school shooting in Finland, uh, Las Vegas, um, Virginia Tech, Columbine, Charlottesville, the McDonald's, Aurora, Las Vegas. Uh, he researched it. He planned it. We went over all the details. How long does it take a cop to respond to a school shooting? The bell schedule. How am I going to transport this? How am I going to transport that? Got to get a lot of ammunition. He fired 139 rounds, and he had plenty left. He had a 40 round that was fully loaded. He had three uh, 30 rounds that were fully loaded. Another 30 round that only had 29 rounds in it. So he was prepared. He, he went through, he did the research, he did the planning, and he carried it out. I submit to you that that aggravating factor of cold, calculated, and premeditated, highly premeditated, is proven beyond any reasonable doubt. The next one is to hinder or disrupt, 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 disrupt a school function. I can, I'll eventually be able to say that. Uh, there's no question that's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. He went into the, uh, to the campus in the 1200 building and uh, was, sh was shooting everybody, every target he could find. And he definitely disrupted and hindered a governmental function to wit school function. And then the next one is that uh, Scott Beagle and Aaron Feist and Christopher Hickson were campus monitors and coaches. Uh, uh, Christopher Hickson and Aaron Feist and Scott Beagle was a geography teacher working for the school board. They were appointed officials in the course of their duties and they were shot down. So that, those, that aggravator is applicable to only them. And then the last one is that um, this was during the course of a burglary. It may sound unusual to you, but when someone uh, enters a place without permission to commit a crime, it's a burglary, okay? So there, uh, the seven, uh, seven aggravating factors that I submit to you have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt and outweigh any mitigation about anything about the defendant's background or character. Uh, it's a weighing process. It's not a counting process. So I want to go over with you uh, now some of the, and, and the defense can present anything, any mitigators uh, that they think is relevant for you all to consider. So I'd like to go over uh, some of them with you right now. And, um, as you know, the defense stated, remember we're picking a jury, that mitigation is not a defense, mitigation is not an explanation, and mitigation is not justification. I agree with that. Mr. Zach, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We have a few people that need to use the restroom. Okay. Uh, so we're going to take a 15-minute uh, restroom break. I apologize for interrupting. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do not discuss the case. Leave your notepads behind. Stay right now. Yes, Your Honor. Okay.
jurors are present. Everyone present. Everyone else may be seated. State whenever you're ready, you may continue. Thank you. I think I left off. Uh, we're going to talk about mitigation, but I want to stress again uh, that it's a weighing process, not a counting process. Uh, I talked about seven aggravating factors. Five aggravating factors are applicable to all 17 victims. Uh, two aggravating factors uh, that hinder or disrupt uh, uh, the school uh, public uh, function, school function, is applicable to Scott Beagle, Aaron Weiss, and Christopher Hickson. And uh, appointed a public official is also only applicable to uh, Scott Beagle, Aaron, Aaron Weiss, and Christopher Hicks. Okay. So, again, weighing, not accounting. So, uh, I'm going to go over some of the mitigating circumstances uh, that uh, the defendant uh, has proposed. And, again, they can propose, and they're unlimited as to anything about the defendant's uh, character or background. Uh, the first one I think they're listing is that the defendant is a human being. The, the next one is that um, the defendant was a diligent and conscientious employee and had a good work history. I agree with that. Uh, he worked at Dollar Tree, he did a good job, had a good work history, but it goes to show that when he wanted to, he can control his behavior. When and when and when he wanted to. And he controlled himself just like at West Glaze. Remember Carrie Yon, his eighth grade teacher? She said when uh, Mr. Lindsay, the assistant principal, was in the class, he behaved himself. Remember, she said that her testimony was he could uh, control himself. And it's like uh, Dr. Denny was talking about. Uh, remember Dr. Denny, the neuropsychologist, was saying, somebody who's truly mentally ill, uh, doesn't matter who's sitting in the room, could be a, a group of police officers, they can't control themselves, but a person with antisocial personality can and does control themselves. Uh, the other, uh, the next one is uh, mitigator that they're proposing is that the birth mother uh, smoked during pre pregnancy. So whether Miss um, Woodard smoked during pre pregnancy or not uh, did not turn uh, Nicholas Cruz into a mass murderer. Uh, the next one was uh, that the birth mother. Um, Brenda Woodard, uh, used drugs during pregnancy. Um, the testimony of Carolyn Deacons and Miss Woodard's daughter, Danielle Woodard, uh, is, is kind of con contradicted by some of the scientific evidence. You know, the meconium test came back negative, and every other drug test, remember Dr. Scott's testimony, every other drug test uh, during pregnancy came back negative. Uh, and of course, you know, one of your, your, your duties as a juror is the weight of credibility of uh, the witnesses. And I suggest to you that Ms. Deacon's member, she said on the arrest in June 8th, 1998, uh, that uh, the drugs were in the back seat. They weren't in her, po in her pocket. If you remember Mr. Marcus's cross-examination and the police report indicated that in truth and in fact, the five crack rocks were in Ms. Deacon's pocket and that she had some resentment to Brenda Woodard. So you can weigh that in, in evaluating someone's testimony. As you can evaluate that uh, Danielle Woodward's uh, lawyer is being paid for, uh, she has a benefit of lawyer that's being paid for by the defendant's brother. Uh, the next one was that the birth mother uh, did not obtain uh, prenatal, prenatal care. Uh, Dr. Scott testified he went through the records uh, and several times he indicated when Miss Woodard went in for prenatal care. And the fact of the matter that the baby, and you can go through the, uh, uh, the birth records, they're, they're in evidence, and Dr. Scott and Dr. Denny did go through them. The baby, the defendant, uh, was born healthy and taken right to uh, the prenatal nursery and not, not anywhere else. You may recall, too, on uh, jury selection, or no, it was opening statement, that the defense said that uh, the baby had to be resuscitated. Remember that? Well, the birth records indicate, and Dr. Scott and Dr. Denny uh, testified that the baby did not have to be resuscitated. Uh, the, another one, at, at Linda Cruz, the mother uh, of uh, the defendant, uh, abused alcohol. Well, 
None of Linda Cruz's friends believed that she was an alcoholic or she abused alcohol. They believed, and a lot of witnesses testified, she was a loving, devoted, and caring mother who tried her best. The next uh, mitigator is the defendant struggled academically throughout his life. Well, records will show that he, when he was at Cross Creek, and yes, it was more structured, but when he wanted to and he uh, applied himself, he got A's and B's because he was motivated. He what? He wanted to go to Marjory Stoneman Douglas High School. So he was partially mainstreamed, and he did so well that he was fully mainstreamed. And he did well at Marjory Stoneman Douglas High School for a while until his girlfriend broke up with him, and then he went back to his old ways. And uh, during elementary school and, and uh, middle school, uh, he didn't have good grades. He didn't have good grades because he got suspended. Uh, he didn't devote himself to the learning process. Uh, he uh, intimidated other students, um, and he didn't participate. So he got bad grades. That's what happens when you don't uh, engage in learning and you don't participate. And it's as Amy Nash, remember um, there was testimony, she didn't testify, but she was the ESE specialist, and she asked him, uh, she worked at West Glades Middle School, uh, why don't you like school? Because it's boring. I'd rather be out on the streets killing animals and setting fires. Uh, the next one, uh, the defendant continues to educate himself while incarcerated. And yeah, he did. Uh, you know, um, you know real, it's like Dr. Denny said, real world actions uh, are better than any testing? Well, he did. I mean, he had, and you know the clips that were played uh, that with Dr. Scott and Dr. Denny? You can take them back with you, and I suggest you do and, and, and look at them. Uh, he knew about the Ukraine-Russian conflict, even had suggestions for Putin and how to resolve it. Uh, he knew more about Putin than most people. Uh, when he got married, where he lived, where he was before he became president, president uh, he retained that information and was able to relate it, uh, you know, a long time later. Uh, and he also did, uh, you know, the drawings that he did that the deputy found in his cell. Uh, look at those. I mean, he reproduced from memory uh, pictures of, of weapons and the school property. Take a look at that. It's pretty good that you can do that from memory. Um, the, uh, the next one was the defendant had neurological and intellectual deficits. Uh, Dr. Denny, tested, the neuropsychologist, uh, testified uh, for the state. And again, uh, Dr. Denny, if you'll recall, is one of seven uh, professionals in the world that are both board certified in neuropsychology and forensic psychology. And he says, and he testified, that the defendant does not have any neurocognitive deficits. Uh, and both uh, Dr. Denny and Dr. Scott did not diagnose a defendant with any of the disorders that come under FASD, whether, uh, and that's fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, whether it's NDPAE or ARND. Uh, they said that that wasn't part of their diagnosis. They didn't feel that was applicable. They felt he had antisocial personality and borderline personality disorder, and he was malingering. FASD and NDPAE and ARND certainly did not cause the defendant to abuse animals, to hate women, to have racist obsessions, uh, or certainly, or to cause him to murder 14 children and three of their caretakers on February the 14th, 2018. Uh, obviously, the defendant has planning and reasoning abilities, because you saw that, all the planning and the research. Uh, how many people know about uh, Jokelin uh, High School in, in Finland, or all these mass murders? And the testimony uh, certainly established that his testing uh, and his performance and his abilities were at least consistent with someone with an 83 IQ. Uh, and he certainly is able to retain things memory-wise and replicate them. Uh, and he also did well, 
you remember the testimony um, at the off-duty uh, campus learning centers when he left um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So again, those clips are available for you to look at and you can judge for yourself. Uh, and also, remember the testimony, and I'm sure you will, of Dr. Scott and Dr. Denny when they said the defendant exaggerates his symptoms uh, and he malingers and he doesn't give his best effort. And uh, they testified about these following tests that he uh, malingered, didn't do his best effort, uh, or exaggerated. The structured inventory of malingered symptomatology, the reliable digit span, nonverbal medical symptom validity test, the Minnesota multifacic personality inventory, and Dr. Denny and Dr. Scott said it went off the charts. You couldn't even judge any of the other categories because of the exaggeration. The personality assessment inventory, the clinical assessment attention deficit, battery for health improvement, memory complaints inventory, trauma symptom inventory, the ray complex figure test, and of course, the finger tapping test. Uh, and uh, you remember Dr. Connor, he was the neuropsychologist, testified for the defense. Uh, 66 of the subtests that were scored, he didn't put on his graph. And of the 66 that he didn't put on his graph, 11 of those subtests dealt with executive functioning. 11 of those tests dealt with the left. Uh, executive functioning, that domain member on the graph, executive functioning, and those 11 tests were all average. They were all average and they were not graphs, but they were on Dr. Denny's graph. He graphed them all, all 145. The next one, uh, the defendant, the defense is offering, is the Department and Children Families um, in September of 2016, um, said that he was a vulnerable adult uh, due to mental illness. Well, that was the allegation that he was a vulnerable adult uh, due to mental illness. That was the allegation. The finding, the final finding was that the defendant, uh, no need for further refer referrals or services. There are three pages uh, that are uh, in evidence. And Aaron, if you put up the first page, if you could, where it lists the allegation. Mr. Sachs, does this need to be private? No, this is, this is fine. Okay, so this can be for everyone. Well, unless the defense doesn't want it, because it's a, uh, children and family services. We have no objection. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Everybody see it? So, see where it says allegation narrative? Right. Everybody see that? Okay, that's the allegation. And then the conclusion is on page three. No implications for V's, that's the defendant's safety, based on recommended disposition narrative as the victim resides with mother receives in-home services from Henderson Mental Health and attends school as well. No other referrals or services were needed. You can review the whole document. It's evidence. I encourage you to do so. And you can look at it and read it, you know, in your leisure, okay? Okay. So that was the allegation. That wasn't the final conclusion. I just read you the final conclusion. The next one, uh, the defendant... Uh, it's proposed by the defense, was not correctly uh, diagnosed as a child and therefore did not receive appropriate interventions. Well, uh, you heard from a lot of the uh, board-certified professionals that had treated uh, the defendant as a child, uh, Dr. Nagin, Dr. Kravitz. Uh, they said, look, we were treating the symptoms. It's not ma doesn't matter what you call it. We were uh, treating the symptoms. And the testimony from even defense witnesses was that Linda Cruz was a loving, caring mother who did her best. And she got different diagnoses because she did not give up on the defendant. 
She took him all over for a different diagnosis to find out why he was behaving like he was. The next one is the defendant was bullied by his peers and his brother. Well, from the testimony and the records, who appears to be the aggressor, even in preschool and in elementary school, pushing other kids around? Uh, the defendant. Uh, who was pushing kids in the hall at West Glades uh, Middle School? The defendant. And let me tell you something. If you have I hate uh, or F ends and a swastika on your backpack and you're walking around high school, who's the bully? And as far as his brother, brother Spike. Brother Spike. The next one is that the defendant has the ability to succeed in a highly structured Florida uh, state prison. Well, he was in the Broward County Jail, and on November 13, 2018, he attacked the deputy, Sergeant Beltran. So that wasn't so great. And then uh, in May, uh, they found 666 written on his uh, cell wall. Uh, I would not call that uh, potential for success. The next one... Uh, that the defendant uh, was raised in a verbally abusive home. Well, from the testimony, the evidence, and the, record, the records that, that, that I remember, uh, he was the one that um, was um, uh, verbally abusive in his home. A as a matter of fact, uh, the YouTube comment, I punch my mom, dumb bitch, I say, uh, that would indicate that you know he's the one that's being uh, abusive. And he grew up in a 4,500 square foot home in Parkland, Florida, had a swimming pool. Uh, and the mother took him from doctor to doctor, to counselor to counselor, to therapist to therapist. She never ignored him. She never neglected him. It appears that Linda Cruz had a good value system. Uh, the defendant had the ability to behave. He just didn't. It's kind of interesting. Danielle Woodward said, I forget who was asking her questions. I don't know if it was Mr. Marcus or maybe somebody from the defense. She wished she could have been raised in a 4,500 square foot home in Parkland. Uh, then the next one, um, the defendant was, uh, defendant was sexually abused by a trusted peer. Well, again, take the clips back with you. Uh, Dr. Denny and Dr. Scott said, uh, when they asked him about it, he was 75 to 80% sure it happened. I don't know, if you're going to be abused, I would think you would be a little bit more than 75 to 80% sure that it happened. And he said he heard it on the news and that his brother could confirm that. And his brother uh, did not uh, verify uh, that allegation. And I'd like to keep for you to keep in mind uh, the diagnosis of Dr. Denny and Dr. Scott of malingering. The next one is the defendant has remorse. Well. On November 13, 2018, he attacked Sergeant Raymond Beltran in the jail. I don't think that shows remorse. And if you remember, uh, there was testimony about Scarlett Lewis. Scarlett Lewis was the lady who lost a child at Sandy Hook Massacre. And she came down here to meet with the defendant. And her goal in life, uh, and it, it's a good goal, is to prevent you know, future Mass murders. A poor woman went through a lot. So after the defendant met with her, and they both said they love each other, he goes back to the jail and he writes, you saw, and please take it back with you, uh, his notes and his drawings. He's talking about future mass murders and how to do it and how much it's going to cost and how to kill people. Uh, I wouldn't call that being remorseful. <coughs> So, you know, in talking about mitigators and, and talking about aggravators and, and, and testing, that, and, and I agree with this, that, uh, and Dr. Denny, you know, said this, um, that real world actions trump any testing, right? So the first one is visual spatial, I'd like to talk to you about, okay? So you can look at the video about the defendant's visual spatial ability. Take the video, the school surveillance we just played, take it back. See if you think he has any problems with visual spatial. 
And then, how about this? He wants to be on the ROTC marksman team. In order to be on the marksmanship team, you have to hit a target first the size of a quarter from 10 meters. 10 meters is 32 plus feet away. It's hard for me to see at 32 feet, let alone hit a target the size of a quarter. You have to do that three times in a row. Then if you do that, then you have to hit a target the size of a nickel three times in a row. And then if you do that, you have to hit the target the size of a dime three times in a row. And I submit to you, someone uh, that can do that certainly doesn't appear to have any kind of spatial, uh, visual spatial uh, problems. And he's also, was, also got a badge for uh, sharpshooter. The other one I want to talk about uh, is about executive function. Uh, one of his YouTube comments, and I mentioned it before, I love to see the family suffer. Remember that? So you're asking me, what's that to do with executive function? I'll tell you, because it's not only looking to inflict pain, uh, fear, and death to the murder victim. You're anticipating how that pain, fear, and death on the murder victim is going to affect the families. He's anticipating what his action in murder is going to do to the families. He's thinking ahead, just like playing chess. So that's why I feel that that is really a good measure of executive function. Dr. Jones testified uh, for the defense, and he said, one, although he didn't know anything about this offense, uh, or any of the defendants uh, searching uh, you know, prior mass shootings or what happened, that he uh, felt that uh, planning, the lack of the ability, the lack of ability to plan <clears throat> is a hallmark of uh, any of the disorders under FASD. Well, one of the hallmarks of this case is the ability to plan. The defense, and what he did in planning it. He not only planned it, he researched other mass shootings. He accumulated uh, all kinds of apparatus, uh, things to do and things to say. Uh, it was a, uh, it was intensive planning. It was detailed. How long does it take a cop to respond to a school shooting? Uh, all that he did. He has the ability to plan and plan well. He accomplished his plan. He accomplished his plan. And he has obviously the ability, the ability to reason. Um, and I mentioned um, Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott is board certified in general psych... He's a medical doctor. He's board certified in general psychiatry, adult and adolescent psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, and forensic psychiatry. And I mentioned Dr. Denny. He's one of the seven neuropsychologists, uh, professionals in the, that are both board certified in... Uh, Neuropsychology and forensic psychology. Neuropsychology and forensic psychology, and they both their opinion was that the defendant has antisocial personality disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder, and they diagnosed malingering. They did not diagnose him with any of the disorders that come under FASD, NDPAE, or ARND. They felt that. Um, it's antisocial personality and not a mental disease. He has the ability to control himself. He can control himself, and he does control his behavior. His actions are voluntary and volitional. They testified uh, that the defendant, uh, because of his antisocial personality, uh, doesn't take blame, and he shifts responsibility. For instance, um, Linda Cruz, uh, the defendant's mother, died, passed away, November the 1st, 
2017. Uh, the defendant had been planning uh, this mass murder long before um, Ms. Cruz passed away. Back in June of 2017, he's looking up uh, mass murders, uh, the McDonald's in uh, San Diego. So uh, one of the things, he, an example they were saying of him shifting blame was, if my mother didn't die, I wouldn't have done this. Yet, he writes on YouTube, on August 11, 2017, I punched my mom, dumb bitch, I say. And as I said, long before his mother passed away, he was planning to be a mass murderer. I would, not, I would have not done this if someone loved me. I would have not done this if someone hugged me. Uh, and I would have not shot two of the girls and one of the campus monitors if they didn't give me a nasty look. There's a real shift for you. Uh, there is no brain damage. There is damage to his personality and to his character. And hate is not a mental disorder. And Dr. Denny and Dr. Scott testified that hate is part of antisocial personality. Uh, so let's look at, at hate here. Uh, there was a swastika on the defendant's boot when he was arrested. Remember at one time he said to somebody he didn't know what it meant, what a swastika meant? So on his backpack it says, fuck excuse me, F ends and a swastika. You don't think it, he knew what it meant? He had a swastika on his boot uh, and you can take uh, back with you his, uh, his comments uh, and what his search is for. He was searching for, remember, a Nazi flag. He wishes the Nazis won the war. You mean to tell me he doesn't know what a swastika means? There's a swastika on both sides of the magazine in the... Uh, uh, his, his rifle that he left on the third floor landing, uh, the 5.56 M&P 15 Smith & Wesson uh, AR-15 style rifle. Uh, and like I said, on, on the backpack. And then you look at the hateful racial comments he's made on YouTube. His hatred of women, his animal abuse, uh, and his search for child pornography, and I'm not going to go over it. it, it's in evidence. You can look for his searches for little girl por pornography. Uh, and, and then also examine uh, what was found in his jail on May 8th of, of 2022, uh, where the deputy found uh, the 666 on the wall. All his drawings about encouraging and describing uh, future mass murders. Uh, Dr. Denny, Dr. Scott said all that is antisocial birth personality. He can control it. It's not a mental disease. Uh, then they gave examples of, you know, they felt he was malingering. And I think a perfect example, and uh, you heard it, I think Mr. Marcus played uh, the, um, the, the audio tape of the defendant when he was firing on the first floor of the 1200 building, how rapidly he fired uh, his gun, uh, and you talk about <clears throat> finger tapping. Uh, so I think, and they said, that was a good example of malingering, uh, that finger tapping test. Another example uh, is that uh, his, he has a manipulative personality, not only with Scarlett Lewis, remember, he goes back in the jail after saying they love each other and they want to stop you know, mass murders, and he's uh, describing future mass murders and how to do it, how much it's going to cost, and how to kill people. Uh, he can control that. And here, uh, Carrie Ann, I, I mentioned it before, she was his eighth grade middle school teacher. And what did she say? Uh, that it was all about him. What he wants and when he wants it, it's all about him. He can control himself, and he certainly controlled himself, she said, when Mr. Lindsay, the assistant principal, was in the room. Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, decisions, and you have to make a decision, uh, you know, on the aggravators and the mitigators. Uh, and 
the decision, uh, you're looking for the right decision. And I submit to you that the right decision is a decision uh, fortified by truth and justice. It, it takes into account uh, the facts, uh, the law, uh, and the truth. It's the right decision for the right reason. And the right reason does not ignore the law or the justice that it brings. So, the defendant had a plan, and we discussed it. He carried it out. Uh, trace arounds, you all know my name. He wanted to be known. That was the goal of his plan, not just to kill at least 20 people, but when you see me on the news, you'll know who I am. Uh, Antisocial personality. Dr. Denny asked the defendant, and you saw the clip, anything else you want to tell me? Yeah. Why I did it on Valentine's Day? Why did you do it on Valentine's Day? I wanted to ruin it for others. Dr. Scott asked the defendant, why would you stop shooting? Couldn't find anyone else to kill. Well, there are 17 individuals uh, that were murdered, and you have to make 17 individual decisions. And I submit to you that the evidence and the testimony prove beyond any reasonable doubt the seven aggravating factors. The five that are applicable to all 17 victims and the two aggravating factors that were applicable just to Scott Beagle, Aaron Feist, and Christopher Hickson. And those aggravating factors, remember, it's a weighing process, not a counting process. And prior convictions for capital offense knowingly cause great, uh, uh, um, knowingly cause great, um, for, um, Fear of death of other people, uh, heinous, atrocious, cruel, cold, calculated, and premeditated, they're all really, really, really heavy aggravators. And they outweigh uh, any mitigation at all. They are so heavy in weight. So I submit to you that the aggravating factors are proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and that those aggravating factors outweigh by a ton any mitigating circumstances. And the appropriate sentences for Gina Montaldo, for Alex uh, Schechter, for Luke Hoyer, for Martin Duque Aquiano, for Elena Petty, for Alyssa Alphadeff, for Helena Ramsey, for Nicholas Durrett, for Carmen Shintrum, for Christopher Hickson, <clears throat> for Aaron Feiss, for Jamie Guttenberg, for Scott Beagle, for Kara Lockman, for Meadow Pollock, for Joaquin Oliver, and for Peter Wang, the appropriate sentence for Nicholas Cruz is the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to take an early lunch break um, as opposed to, to taking a break and then starting. Uh, with the defense closing just before lunchtime. Uh, so it's 11.15 now. I'm going to ask if you please be back at 12.45. So it's 11.20 now, so that gives you just a little bit uh, less than an hour and a half. You could please be back at 12.45 so that we can uh, begin with the defense closing. Uh, other than that, remember the, the rules. I know you all remember them. Do not, dis you can probably tell, tell me yourselves, uh, do not discuss the case, do not uh, speak to anyone about the case, if anyone...